The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 4248 in the name of Maurice Golden on WWF Earth Hour 2017. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Morris Golden to open the debate. Mr Golden, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. At 8.30pm on the 25th of March, thousands of Scots joined millions around the world to mark Earth Hour. From all walks of life, they came together to highlight something that affects every man, woman and child on this planet, climate change. The concept of Earth Hour was started by my good friend Andy Ridley in Sydney in 2007. We worked on a world first, well actually a, a world second, with a circle scan measuring material flows in Glasgow. I could go on, but the debate today is about Earth Hour. And the first ever Earth Hour resulted in a 10% reduction on the electricity grid, saving 25,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. But now it has grown into a global event. It is no exaggeration to say that climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our age. It affects everyone, everywhere, and every facet of our lives. It is fitting, therefore, that so many have come together to recognise that. In Scotland, the figures speak for themselves. Every local authority, more than a thousand schools, hundreds of businesses and organisations, more than two dozen public bodies, and almost two thirds of MSPs took part to raise awareness of climate change. The global nature of the threat we face was evident as more than 3,000 landmarks around the world, such as Big Ben, the Eiffel Tower, the Sydney Opera House, dimmed their lights in support. In Scotland, we showed that we were part of this common struggle with more than 160 landmarks joining in, such as the Kelpies, the Forth Road Bridge, and Clyde Bank's Titan Crane in the west of Scotland. My Twitter post that evening had me smiling and beaming into the mobile uh, phone camera, looking like an extra from The Shining. But recognising local Im involvement is important because this is a fight in which we all have a part to play. And I am proud that four local, or, local authorities in the West have recognised by the WWF for their exceptional support. East Renfrewshire, East Dumbartonshire, North Ayrshire and West Dumbartonshire all received WWF's Super Local Authority badge. And I congratulate each one of them. Most importantly, though, was the almost 1,200 schools across Scotland, including many across the west of Scotland, that took part in Earth Hour, showing enormous creativity in highlighting this serious issue. It's Scotland's children who will live with climate change and who will soon take up the torch in tackling it. Their involvement is testament to both the level of awareness and concern there is amongst young people and about climate change. The strength of feeling was evident earlier this year when a William Wood High School pupil in East Renfrewshire, a young lady named Rumeza Zubari, won Young Scott WWF Poetry Contest. Her poem lamented a world that might be where climate change has ravished our environment. It is a stark call to action for all of us and serves as a reminder that we are working to ensure that our children inherit a better world than we did. We have made progress and there is much to be proud of here in Scotland when it comes to combating climate change. Since 1990, we have reduced emissions by almost 50%, met our emissions targets for the first time and seen renewables generate more than half of Scotland's electricity needs. Last week, Britain as a whole went a day without coal power for the first time since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Perhaps the most important statistic, though, is that the 2009 Climate Change Act was passed unanimously, underlining that climate change cuts across party lines and has the wide support vital to take on the challenge 
of this magnitude. That is also evident in today's debate, and I welcome the opportunity to hear from other members across the chamber. But we mustn't allow the progress we have made so far to cloud our judgment with regard to the task ahead of us. Tackling climate change is more than cutting energy use or reducing emissions. It's about developing a sustainable future. The draft climate change plan sets out some bold objectives for Scotland. That is to be welcomed. We must also recognise that simply setting targets doesn't get the job done. There needs to be a clear path to each target that allows for monitoring, analysis and ultimately completion. We must increase our recycling rate. We must reduce transport emissions, which haven't budged for around 30 years. We need to heat our homes more efficiently. We must engage better with farmers and landowners to create sustainable land management. And our economy needs to be more circular by maximising our nation's resources. Scotland needs those ideas because the old ways aren't working anymore. And our success rests on no one person, political party or campaign group, but rather the cooperation and hard work of each of us. Earth Hour reminds us that our world is as fragile as it is incredible. In her poem, Remeza says, our world is evolving, changing, and we are changing it. For the sake of our children, let's make sure we are changing it for the better. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Mr. Golden. Now the open debate, speeches of four minutes, please. Graham Day to be followed by Finlay Carson. Mr. Day, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as the member who led the Parliament's last Earth Hour debate in 2015, let me congratulate Morris Golden on opting to lead his first member's debate on this subject. And let me advise him that he joins a select band of MSPs. Much to my surprise, I discovered today that he, myself and Shirley Ann Somerville are the only members to have taken the opportunity to highlight this hugely significant and symbolic event through a member's business motion debate. And Earth Hour is a hugely significant symbolic event. March 25 saw the 11th annual Earth Hour take place. 11 years of people, businesses and landmarks around the world turning off their lights at 8.30pm to focus minds on climate change. This year, as we've heard, an unprecedented 187 countries and territories took part, over 3,000 landmarks switched off their lights, and millions of individuals, businesses and organisations across seven continents took part. Yes, this is a symbolic gesture that needs backed up by firm action, but whether through the act of turning off your lights or walking past homes, businesses or landmarks without their usual glow does make you stop and think. And if considering the issues leads to behavioural change individually and collectively, then Earth Hour has achieved its purpose. Buildings in my constituency which participated this year included the iconic Arbroath Abbey and a multitude of schools. I am of course delighted that we here in Scotland are making good progress in relation to our climate change targets and that the Scottish Government is committed to raising the bar still further through the climate plan and the forthcoming bill. Because far-reaching action is required across the planet to safeguard it for future generations. This generation was slow to react. We are playing catch-up. We need to ensure the next generation is fully alive to the challenge the planet faces. And that's why the participation in Earth Hour of young people is so important. I recognise, of course, that pupils, or staff for that matter, won't have been in schools on a Saturday night, but there will have been lessons educating them about why their school is participating. There will be important classes about the potential impacts of climate change, encompassing the message that they can do a little, change a lot. Members who've heard me speak before about tackling climate change will know that I'm a firm believer, as others are, that behavioural change is a key component. Uh, as we're aware, participating in Earth Hour is a voluntary act. It's about people taking action because they believe that we as a society have to. WWF, the campaign group behind Earth Hour, has on its website a number of what it sees as Earth Hour heroes. I want to tell the story of one, Ahmed from the Maldives. As members may know, the Maldives is a nation made up of a number of low-lying islands, which is majorly threatened by climate change. Ahmed, in his day job, crunches numbers at a broadcasting company. He first found out about Earth Hour in 2009 and quickly worked out that if it, it 
could become an ideal platform to revive a much-needed national debate on the climate. He secured partnerships with the government, organisations and the Scout Association of the Maldives and over the years has managed to engage schools on every island in the Maldives today. Who can forget the site from 2009 when the government of the Maldives held a cabinet meeting underwater to highlight to the world the threat that climate change poses to this country? The Cabinet Secretary will no doubt be relieved that I'm not calling on our Cabinet to spend half an hour on the seabed communicating with white boards and hand signals in order to conduct government business, entertaining though that might be. But that action by President and the Xi's government really did highlight the whole climate change issue and in a memorable way. Presiding officer, here's to 8.30pm on the 24th of March 2018, next year's Earth Hour, by which point we should have a much clearer picture of how the nations of this planet are going to live up to the commitments they made to tackling climate change in Paris. Of the 195 signatures to the agreement, only 143 countries thus far have indicated what they will be doing up to 2030. So as well as celebrating the symbolism of Earth Hour tonight, let's be clear also that we need progress made on the actions planned across the globe to tackle climate change. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Day. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr. Carson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin to thank uh, Morris and congratulate him for securing this uh, debate on Earth Hour. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges we face. It threatens us in so many forms. Heavier rain, hotter weather, rising sea levels are the real effects that we can all notice over the years. And of course, there is the threat to our environment and wildlife. Hotter summers with more drought will undoubtedly have impact on our natural environment and potentially upon agriculture. We all have a duty to the next generation to leave Scotland in a better state than we found it. Earth Hour is a fantastic initiative by the World Wildlife F Foundation to raise awareness of climate change and provide an opportunity for us to think about ways in which we can address climate change. And at the point is that we can all, the point is we can all do our bit. This year's Earth Hour on the 25th of March saw thousands of schools, landmarks, public buildings and homes across Scotland turn their lights off for an hour. We all have a responsibility to do our bit, whether that be recycling our household waste, turning lights off when we aren't in the room, thinking about whether we really need to print that email or that briefing off, or small things which are not only good for the environment but save a few pennies in the process. I was very privileged to spend Earth Hour at uh, Murray's Monument, I'm sure an area that uh, the presiding officer is very familiar with. I drove from Minigaf up into the centre of Europe's first dark sky park to the biggest forest park in the United Kingdom, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree a fine, cabin, a, a fine uh, example of what could be Scotland's third national park. I'm proud that my local authority, Dumfries and Galloway, was awarded a super local authority badge for their level of participation in the 2017 WWF Earth Hour. And I'd like to take this opportunity to give special mention to some of the schools in my constituency who took part. Shawhead, Closeburn, Dalbiti, Wigton, Dromore Primary Schools and Stranar Academy. It's absolutely fantastic to see that our young people are getting engaged with such important initiatives. It's also incumbent on all of us as parliamentarians to ensure that we are setting ambitious programmes towards a low-carbon Scotland that will be so vital to our children's future. The Scottish Parliament re recently scrutinised the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan. A range of weaknesses in the current draft have been highlighted by all four committees involved. The WWF said of the plan, although the plan presents an often strong description of a low-carbon economy in 2030, there is a consistent absence of sufficient specific policies in almost every sector to ensure we achieve our climate targets through to 2032. It's simply not enough to paint a strong narrative without specific policies to ensure that we achieve these target change, uh, targets. It's incumbent on the Cabinet Secretary to fully consider the recommendations made and come back to Parliament later this year with a robust and ambitious plan that has the policies to back up the rhetoric. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to participate in the debate on Earth Hour and the importance of recognising and tackling the many real concerns that climate change presents. It's all too easy for us to forget or shrug off our responsibilities to protect this planet for the next generation, and we cannot allow that to happen. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I call Claudia Bleemish to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Ms Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In the words of WWF Scotland, Earth Hour 2017 provided a moment for us all to think about how much more we can do to address climate change. It is such a simple and yet profoundly brilliant idea. It is unlikely that people will spend that hour alone. Much more likely is that they will be involving those who they are spending the weekend or evening with, and just as likely that they might invite people to join them to make a party with a purpose out of it. In my case, this was a candlelit climate change chat with partner Michael, daughter Freya, son-in-law Talon Chai, who's Thai, and two-year-old grandson Maka. Actually, an hour can feel like a long time in a really good way. Part of the power of it was the sense that people were doing similar across the world. It felt hopeful and inspiring. And I want to thank WWF for the organisation this takes year after year for, in their words, a symbol of care for our brilliant planet. I also want to thank Maurice Golden for his debate about, as he put it, a common struggle. Climate change concerns push us all, whatever party we belong to, and indeed none. And this debate gives us further opportunity to share thoughts on the way forward and to share some special projects. I want to share three with you tonight, all from the last week, and ask how us as politicians can help even more. On Saturday, I was honoured to cut the ribbon to open a yurt for People's Can. The yurt was to be a shelter for those helping in the community garden. And one mum told me of her daughter's enthusiasm that morning. Olive's face lit up as we entered the community garden. She's normally shy of new things, but not here. Non-stop non drumming for 20 minutes, and from this we decided to go every month and make use of the vegetable beds and help out wherever we can. This year, Peebles Can was lucky in, in getting um, money from the Climate Challenge Fund for Grow, Cook, Build and Own, which is their project to empower local people and families to build a sustainable Peebles. And the Climate Challenge Fund is indeed a large amount of money, 9.97 million pounds. Recognising this value, let's all fight for even more next time so projects like this can be the norm across Scotland. I see the Cabinet Secretary smiling. Uh, let's also ensure that the Scottish Government behaviour change commitments in the draft climate change plan are acted on robustly. On Saturday evening, I went to see a play at the Bigger Corn Exchange, a one-woman play performed by Edie Goodwin. It was called What the Frack? Edie says... As a young person, I see fracking as a hugely important issue, one that could have an immeasurably detrimental impact on health, democracy, life as a whole on this land which we share. So at the start of December, I found out that a public consultation was going to take place and I decided my contribution to the debate would be through theatre. I decided I was going to write a play. This indeed she did. And Edie's creation shows how individual fortitude and creativity can make a difference. She believed she had to do something to tell the story of fracking so far and the dangers as she sees them to counteract the power of big corporations. As politicians, we must indeed listen to people just as much as to big money here and globally. And finally, actually tomorrow, uh, South Lanarkshire and East Kilbride TUC is taking a motion as amended by... PCS union to the STUC Congress. I quote, Congress believes that a, just, a transition to a low carbon economy must be a just transition. This includes looking to support those communities and nations across the world that will be most immediately at risk. It also means ensuring that workers and communities in Scotland need to be assured that jobs will be created in the low carbon industries as part of this transition. In the spirit of Earth Hour, let's be sure that this happens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beamish. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Ash Denham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Maurice Golden for bringing this debate to the Chamber this evening after a somewhat challenging afternoon for the environment in this Parliament. And I'd like to congratulate WWF and welcome the efforts of all those participating in Earth Hour this year. To have all 32 councils, 130 landmarks, 25 public bodies, 48 community events, hundreds of businesses and 1,000 schools involved in Scotland is a major, major achievement. And with 172 countries and 7,000 cities participating worldwide, it's now a long way from that inaugural Big Flick event in Sydney back in 2007. 
But I think it is important to recognize what Earth Hour is and what it isn't, because the event has had its critics over the years, including from the wider green movement. Now, it's clearly not a way to reduce the nation's energy consumption by a huge amount, with most participating nations reducing demand by around 4% during the hour itself. But to focus on this is really to miss the point, because what Earth Hour delivers is strong awareness and debate, and it has also inspired action. Russian activists used Earth Hour to publicize a petition to protect Russian oceans from oil contamination. It gained over 120,000 signatures and eventually led to a new law being passed. Raising awareness, even if only for a single hour, can be a springboard for other forms of direct action. Now, there are those who see sitting in darkness for an hour as a bleak, back-to-the-cave, anti-technology message. Now, I acknowledge that it could be seen that way, but for most, it's about stopping for a moment, not just to reflect on the impact of energy use, but also to reflect on how we take technology's positive contribution often for granted. Then, of course, there's the debate about power and decision-making that Earth Hour often leads to. Switching off lights around homes and monuments will clearly not decarbonize an energy system run by corporations tempered through government-regulated markets. But even as symbolic a gesture as switching off appliances does begin the journey towards democratization of our energy system. The smart meter rollout across the UK builds on that simple act of switching off, growing awareness of patterns of demand in our homes and businesses. And from that step comes the design of white goods and electric cars, for example, that can balance supply and demand through smart systems linked to renewable energy generation in the building and through the national grid. And from that step, we can build solutions on a community scale, using generation from wind farms to solar and hydro, providing financial benefits that could be so much more widespread. And alongside renewable electricity, we can finally start delivering meaningful progress on renewable heating taking waste heat currently warming the sky to homes currently living in fuel poverty. With all these positive directions for energy, there are real opportunities for individuals, consumers, tenants and councils to be driving progress on their own or collectively through co-ops and municipal energy companies. A true energy democracy could build on that historic legacy of Tom Johnston who brought power to the glens and delivered Scotland's first renewables revolution. And in so doing, we build the political support for governments worldwide to switch investment away from the infrastructure that locks in emissions for generations to come, reinvesting low-carbon infrastructure from railways to renewables that will allow us as citizens to always make the right choices. Deputy Presiding Officer, that's what I see in the darkness of an Earth Hour every year. It's a bright future with energy citizens and the well-being of future generations at its heart. And I look forward to it becoming a reality. Thank you very much. I call Ash Denham to follow by John Scott. John Scott's the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by extending my thanks to Morris Golden for securing chamber time to discuss this issue. And as we've heard from the member, uh, thousands in Scotland join millions around the world in turning off their lights to stand up for protecting the planet. Here in Edinburgh, many landmarks, organisations, businesses and people took part in WWF's Earth Hour. Over a thousand Scottish schools participated, such as Craig and Tinnery Primary School in my own constituency, Edinburgh Eastern. And for students there and across Scotland, Earth Hour provided that opportunity to spend the day learning about environmental issues and how important it is to protect our planet. Edinburgh restaurants shut off their lights, holding special events by candlelight. Edinburgh residents took to Twitter to post photos of themselves, themselves celebrating Earth Hour by reading or doing work by candlelight. And Edinburgh's greatest landmark, Edinburgh Castle, went dark just after lighting up green in support of the environment. And that was on top of 81 members of the Scottish Parliament who took part in Earth Hour. And it's reassuring that something as vital as protecting our environment and fighting climate change is that shared priority amongst all the parties and also our, the constituents that we represent. And obviously Scotland has done a tremendous amount to be a leader in environmental stewardship, and also in tackling climate change. Reducing the amount of energy we use is, of course, a really good way to contribute to fighting climate change. And by way of personal example, I've changed on this myself over the years. And I remember this um, uh, from when I was a child in the 1980s. I had this friend 
whose father was really quite scary, and that's possibly because he was a black belt in karate, but also because he had this absolutely iron cast, lights off in an empty room policy. And he would shout really quite aggressively at all his family members to make sure that they all complied with this. And I must say that at the time, as a child, I compared what was going on in their home to what was going on in my own home when the lights were all on, nobody seemed to be too bothered about that. And I think at the time, I felt quite glad that my family lived the way they did. But fast forward a few decades, and I now religiously turn off all the lights in the empty rooms. And although um, my beseeching my kids to do the same seems to, at the moment, have fallen on deaf ears so far, judging by the amount of time that I spend going around the house after them, turning off the bathroom light, unwatched TVs and unused radios, it will sink in eventually, I'm hoping. So it's reassuring that if I can change, even if it took me a while, then it gives me hope that we can expect further behavioural change on this issue. So Earth Hour is that opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to protecting the planet. And I commend all the MSPs who took part in it, and also WWF for working in close partnership with the Parliament. It has reinvigorated um, our commitment in Edinburgh, across Scotland, across the world, to support the environment. So let's all continue to do that, to show partnership on this issue and in to ensure also that Scotland remains a global leader on the environment. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Scott. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and a food producer with interest in climate change and environmental enhancement protection going back over at least the last 25 years? Can I also congratulate Maurice Golden on securing this debate today again allowing him to demonstrate his and the Conservative Party's enthusiasm for proactive environmental improvement and addressing climate change. And can also thank WWF for their helpful briefing note. So, presiding officer and me, the journey began in the 1990s as the chairman of our Ayrshire Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, known affectionately as FWAG, and that is why I was very much in favour of the Earth Hour 2017 and I want to congratulate all of those in Ayr constituency, particularly, but Ayrshire generally, and across Scotland who took part in Earth Hour 2017. I want to congratulate Conservative-led South Ayrshire Council for their six-year campaign on this issue, which is why they have been awarded a Super Local Authority badge. More importantly, perhaps, I want to congratulate all those who took part in my year constituency, particularly our enthusiastic and dynamic school pupils and their teachers. And from the list I have been given, it appears that almost all primary and secondary schools in Air Presbyterian and Troon <laughs> took part in some way in marking the earth hour, too long to mention them all. In addition, South Ayrshire Council staff across Air Presbyterian and Troon, as well as NHS Ayrshire and Arnstar, took part in this now significant event in the South Ayrshire calendar, and my congratulations to them too. And all of the events and projects are important because they encourage the awareness of our local people of what a magnificent place we live in, but also perhaps inspire some of our school children to go out and make a real difference to the future of our planet. That what needs to be done in meeting our climate change targets is beyond doubt, and inspiring our school leavers and students to be part of the generation that will have to define itself by tackling climate change will not just be about self-interest and their part, but also about the very future of the Earth as we know it today. So low carbon policies are more essential than ever before, and we will need determined commitment from us all to tackle emissions from areas where we have thus far been less than successful in Scotland. Insulation of homes and buildings must continue to be improved and money spent in this area will provide many bangs for the same buck by reducing not just fuel poverty but also by improving all the areas of physical and mental health as well as reducing emissions. The encouragement of the use of electric vehicles has the potential to deliver much needed reduced emissions in transport and a combination of regulation and investment to develop this is overdue particularly in the area of short journeys. And I was surprised to be told just recently that using an electric quad bike on farm could save up to 3,500 years per bike per year by not using petrol. Remarkable. Which again takes me back to agricultural and food production, 
where I know more can be achieved, in my view, by the continued development of cooperation and collaboration, not just in production of food from farming, but also by better off-farm supply chain management and collaboration. Scotland Food and Drink, under James Withers' leadership, is successfully finding the markets for our finished food and drink production. But the difficulty for food pro processors will shortly become the sourcing of sustainably and economically produced authentic Scottish produce to meet the growing demand from our high quality end products. So there is much to be done in developing sustainable low carbon policies, particularly in the areas particularly in the fields of insulation, transport and food production. And this is indeed a very real challenge area of work and an opportunity for future generations. That is why the catalytic and inspirational effect of the Earth Hour is therefore hugely worthwhile and vital. And I again congratulate Maurice Golden on bringing this motion to Parliament today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call on Rosanna Cunningham to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Seven minutes or thereabout, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I have to admit I didn't, wasn't quite sure whether to commiserate or congratulate Maurice Golden on tonight's debate, uh, commiserate him for being a month late, or congratulate him on being 11 months early. So I'm not quite sure whether today's debate will do uh, to count for two years' worth. Graham Day is obviously the one keeping the stats on this. Um, but I am surprised to find it's only the third such debate in the history of Parliament. Um, the success of Earth Hour is obvious. I don't think I need to repeat some of the stats that have already been uh, referred to. Uh, participation of hundreds of millions of people across the planet uh, show that success. And obviously in Scotland this year, as part of Earth Hour, a massive 4,600 people backed a strong Scottish climate action plan for the Scottish Government, uh, which is a strong show of support for the government's continued action on climate change. So I'm delighted to add my own congratulations to WWF and to everyone who made this year's Earth Hour a success. My own house is always in darkness for Earth Hour, well, apart from a few candles maybe, and it isn't really a, a, a difficulty at all uh, to have that hour uh, like that. Mark, was, Mark Ruskell was correct to point out that it sometimes reminds us what we take for granted in terms of technology. Now, the Scottish Government's support for Earth Hour this year enabled WWF Scotland to coordinate engagement across the country from local government and the wider public sector to schools and local community groups and we've heard lots of examples uh, here this evening. And the Scottish Government of course switched off St Andrew's House, Victoria Quay, Atlantic Quay, Softon House. Glasgow City Council too are to be commended for their choice of Earth Hour to launch their partnership with Pittsburgh, a partnership to share experiences and learning of how to create more sustainable and low carbon cities. And I thought that was a fine way to mark the occasion with a kind of action that perhaps uh, people weren't thinking about. Everybody's thinking about switching off. In that sense, um, Glasgow uh, Council found a way, metaphorically speaking, to switch on, uh, which I think was very good too. So I think Maurice Golden was right to emphasize the enormous uh, buy-in. As he recognised, Scotland is a world leader in tackling climate change with strong progress against ambitious statutory targets. And it is no small thanks to the cross-party nature of the commitment in this chamber that we have made this achievement. Scotland is actually only one of a small number of countries who have, in fact, enshrined long-term emissions reduction targets in legislation. It isn't as normal as we might assume because we've done it. It is actually quite rare. And, act, and, and only one of the EU 15 states, Sweden, has achieved greater reductions uh, than Scotland. Uh, people have talked about the draft climate change plan. We have set out uh, proposing driving emissions down further by 66% in 2032. The plan, together with the energy strategy and a new climate change bill in response to the Paris Agreement, uh, will deliver a low carbon transition for Scotland, which promotes social inclusion and sustainable growth. But of course, as a number of members have also uh, referred to, we can never pause in this. We, we have to keep moving in this one. The Paris Agreement in 2015 has seen 195 countries adopting the first ever universal, legally binding global climate deal. And despite the slightly depressing news that occasionally emanates from the White House in this particular policy area, it is worth remembering that there are other American actors with different agendas. The First Minister met with Governor Jerry Brown of California earlier this month 
and they've agreed to work together to support the under two coalition, now, by the way, covering over one billion people and a third of the global economy to help prepare for a major summit in 2018. That's important. Earth Hour demonstrates that when we act collectively, we do have the power to make a difference. And that's true internationally as well as at the local and individual level. But of course, influencing everyday actions is key to delivering our climate change ambitions. We know the key climate actions where individuals and households can really make a difference. These range from home energy and travel to avoiding food waste and reuse. And the outcomes and associated actions in the climate change plan must be supported and owned by the people of Scotland. We know that the majority of people don't discuss climate change on a regular basis, uh, although many are actively involved in climate-friendly behaviours at home, work or in their communities. As part of ongoing engagement with the public, we initiated a series of climate conversations across Scotland starting in summer last year just to take the temperature of public views on climate change and actions that might, might be needed to tackle it. And this pioneering approach is the first of its kind in the UK and does represent a step change in our approach towards public engagement. These conversations are continuing across Scotland and we have developed free resources including a how-to guide to help as many organisations and community groups as possible to participate in the climate conversations. Now, uh, Claudia Beamish uh, um, talked about the Climate Challenge Fund. Um, since 2008, the Scottish Government has given funding of around £85.8 million to 622 communities across Scotland to take forward local action on climate change. And I actually don't think there's anything like it anywhere else in the world. And that's another thing that we need to remind ourselves of. We are sometimes pioneering uh, in this country. Now, Maurice Golden quoted some poetry, and uh, I intend to close uh, with a very short McDermott poem as well, that some may know and some may not, but I think is quite appropriate for this particular debate. It's called The Bonnie Brook at Bairn. Mars is bra and cramacy, Venus in a green silk gown. The old moon shakes her gowden feathers, their starry talks, a wheen no blethers, nain for thee a thochty sparen, earth, thou bonny brookit bairn. But greet, and in your tears you'll droon the hail Clanjamfrey. Fixing climate change will stop the earth green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I hope the official report got that bit. <laughs> and uh, that concludes the debate, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.